gonna go like this. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So, thank Richard. I, I thank him for last week. Uh, we were in the midst of a COVID battle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, somebody in our office building uh, introduced the concept of COVID, and everybody in our office got it rather quickly. They said, bam, 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 bam. So, we've been sort of staging coming back to work that way, too. Uh, but <clears throat> when you're Running a business, you just sort of have to lock the doors and get it done. <clears throat> but thank you all for coming this morning. We are going to be in <clears throat> on our lesson 16, but it's in chapter 13 in the book of Revelation, if you will turn, turn there. <clears throat> um, I have to give some sad news about Spartacus. <clears throat> Spartacus, you know, is our, our new rooster. I was actually talking to Richard on the phone the other day and I uh, heard a commotion and I said, started, Marissa, you need to go check on your chickens, so I did. And they all seemed fine. Got through talking to Richard and said, oh, I, I need to do something, so I ran back to the house to the garage and Marisa said, why are all your chickens in my yard? Okay, that's a big no-no. <laughs> chickens do not go in her yard. In fact, she has a saying, the first chicken that hits the grass is dinner. <laughs> so I said, I don't know, but I went around and sure enough, I mean, they hadn't touched the grass yet, but they were really close. <clears throat> so I said, what could have caused this? And I am learned what a shepherd is. You sort of you know, herd your chicken sort of back and got them all going and back toward their coop. And uh, then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Spartacus flying away. <coughs> Chicken Hawk got him. So he's, he's gone. <coughs> so um, I called the guy that I bought my rooster from, and I said, hey, you wouldn't by chance happen to have another rooster? And he said, what happened? And I told him the story, and he's like, I think I have one more, Paul. He said, but keep this one locked up. So I have now got a special area for the new rooster when he arrives. He doesn't get out till, till he gets his spurs and can take care of himself. So Spartacus is no more. But the, but the other hens are good. They're, they're all eating healthy and good. Do y'all know what um, mealworms are? So chickens love mealworms. They're, they're dried. They're, they're dried. They're, they're not alive. I don't want to put my hand in a box with a bunch of live worms. But... Um, <clears throat> They, when they see me coming, if I have them out and they see me coming, that's how I got them back. Is they think I'm going to get them a treat, so they, they just sort of flock around with you. They're hilarious. I actually had a picture. I was trying to get it here early enough to get it put on, so I know y'all can't see this, but I'll show it to you. That's Bertha. <laughs> that's Bertha wanting her treat today. Bertha, her name's Bertha. We have Bertha, Rocky. We have number one, number two, and number three <clears throat> because at one time I refused to name them. If you name them, they die. Uh, <clears throat> and we have Spot, and we have Red, and we have Scruffy. So we, we gave them all different names. <clears throat> Chickens are hilarious. That's one of, I mean, if you just, God made some animals just to laugh at. Chickens are one of those. <clears throat> okay, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous, blasphemous, uh, yeah, names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet like a bear's, its mouth like a lion's mouth. <clears throat> and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. 
It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given, <coughs> given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb of the Life, the book of the Life, Book of Life, the, the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone has been taken cap to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must be slain. Here is the call for endurance and faith of the saints. So, <clears throat> in these verses, we start, we see that the dragon, that's the, the first character. And now we see a beast coming out of the sea. This beast has been, has, has been wounded, but he's healed. So he's been wounded by the sword that we'll learn in, later in this chapter. But he's been healed. And so all the nations around are like, who is like the beast? Who can be like him? And so they start, they're going to pledge their allegiance because they don't think the beast can be defeated. <clears throat> they don't think that, that um, anyone can overthrow the beast. So the beast is a representative of the Roman Empire. The wound in the head is the civil war, in, in my belief, the civil war that they went through, but it's now healed under Vespasian as he brings the empire back together. He's the one that went through all the, the generals and they were fighting for that. Rome was almost destroyed. He brings it back together and it will continue to grow. So the other nations that are looking at the Roman Empire are saying, wow, if they can overcome this, they can overcome anything. And they pledge their allegiance to it, which causes it, by the year 147 AD, the Roman Empire is covering all the known world. It has spread to, and they've conquered, or else a country has pledged its allegiance to there. So the Roman, the Roman Empire, when it took over a nation, they allowed that nation to still practice whatever beliefs, whatever they had there. What Rome wanted was their resources. Rome wanted their their money, their gold, through taxation. <clears throat> they wanted that put. That's why that's, there's a phrase, all roads lead to Rome. That's why they built the roads, because they do come back to Rome. So it was easy for them to bring those resources back in to the Roman Empire. So as long as you didn't kick up any waves, you were pretty much okay with them. <clears throat> Just don't go against uh, anything that they were there. So as a Christian, though, as a Christian, you couldn't abide with that. You couldn't do that because we were given directions from our Lord and Savior to do what? Teach. To teach, right? To teach what? What are we teaching? The truth. The truth. And that truth is? that declares what? <laughs> How many gods are there? One. There's one God. And he loved us and he sent his son to die for us and his son defeated death and rose from the tomb. Right? That's the good news. That's the gospel. And we're to preach Christ to everyone. Rome's got a problem with that. That creates waves. You know, I, 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 I want to go over here and do this. Uh, what, what about, you know, Jupiter? I want to go worship Jupiter. What about the sun god? <clears throat> they had a problem with Christians doing that. And the part where it's saying that the beast is being given his authority by the dragon, <laughs> Satan, we know, is the dragon. 
And he's promoting this and pushing this because as we learned a couple of weeks ago, he's going to attack the church. He's going to attack. He can't, he's lost the battle in heaven. He's been defeated. The heavenly battle, Satan has been, but he's been cast down to the earth. He's been cast down. And so then he tries to go and he tries to destroy the remnant. And it says, woe to the earth because Satan has been cast down to you. And he said, I'm, this is in the vision, John's seeing, he said he's going to go after the offspring of the woman, the remnant. That's the church. And so these warnings that are here for that, those seven churches that must soon take place, Jerusalem has been destroyed. And now what's next? This is the what's next for them. Because... Our God does, did not want them to think, well, just because Jerusalem's been destroyed, it's all over. No. Satan hates God. Satan hates us because we're children of God. He's coming after the church. God's warning his people. He's coming after you, and he's going to use the Roman Empire to do that. How did he do that? Through <clears throat> captivity, through killing, through torture, anything that he could to try to persuade men not to follow God. Okay? So I, I know I've asked before how many have been to Rome <clears throat> and seen uh, the areas there. There's actually the, the river that comes through. There's a little island where, that's in the middle of the river right there, close to the Vatican. And over in a, the other section, to, to the right, as you're looking north to the right, is where the Jewish people lived. They kept them separated from the normal citizens there. They kept them walled off and over in an area. And just right north of that is the catacombs. <clears throat> so the, the catacombs are where the Christians in that area would hide to worship. If you were going to be baptized in that time, you took an extra set of clothes. They did it at night. They would take you to the river late at night, hoping no one saw, and would baptize you and change. You would change clothes so that you wouldn't, people wouldn't ask why you're wet. Basically, why, why are you wet? But everything had to be done in secrecy, trying to preserve the church. So that's why you read about the catacombs and the worshiping, and you can still see that today where they were worshiping there in the catacombs and doing doing that. You'll also, yes sir? My sister, they were missionaries in China at one time and, and they would, uh, because of the monitoring online that we would speak, we couldn't say things like, uh, you're baptized, they baptized someone, they would say we went swimming with someone uh, because the algorithm would pick it up and they would go into a file and if they got, you know, a speeding ticket, they checked their file and they would see baptism they would see Christian, and they would, uh, they would go to jail. And so we live in a society that's, we have a society not far from us that's doing the same. Yeah, I, I read a, the other day where China, a lot of the, those that have become Christians actually worship in the middle of the lake in boats, in rowboats. Okay, so Sunday morning, everybody's got to get in the rowboat and you go out to the center for that very reason is trying to avoid, they try to do it while the fog is still on the lake so that no one can see them and do that. So yes, even today we're still experiencing that. So if you're a Christian during, the, during this period of time, you come into town and um, someone might do that with their foot. I know y'all can't see that. Did y'all see that? 
Okay. <laughs> they didn't do it that obvious, okay? Okay. <laughs> and if the response from the other person was this, you know, sort of like that, and a little drawing in the sand there. Fish. You made a fish. You made a fish, and then you could dust that up. That's how they had to communicate things like that. So even in this, in this letter, it's in symbols, trying to disguise so the, 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 what they're saying. Because if they wrote a letter that said, hey, the Roman Empire is a beast and it's going to be destroyed, you're going to die. So that's why we have these symbols that are here, but the symbols can be interpreted. We can know today what those symbols mean. So, here we go. In verses 1 and 2, chapter 13 reveals that the, this uh, terrifying beast is there. The dragon takes his stand there in the sea. The beast rises out of the sea. The beast has ten horns and seven heads, ten diadems on its horns. And he has these blasphemous, I cannot say that word today, names were written on its heads. So it's, it's got the same symbols as we read about that the dragon had. So the beast and the dragon have the same symbol. So that um, <clears throat> the beast is great in power, he has authority, he has a strength, and the beast is like a leopard with feet like a bear, a mouth like a lion. <clears throat> he has, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority to the beast. Why did he do that? So that he could go against <clears throat> the offspring of the woman, the church, to do that. So now you'll see that futurists are those that proclaim, what is this? They're going to start, they're going to tell you that, well, that's a picture of the Antichrist. Uh, <clears throat> that's something that's happening there. But remember, the book of Revelation was for them. It was about, it's for things that must soon take place that was not talking about today. It was not talking about 2,000 years or any time in the future. It's talking about what was going to happen right after the fall of Jerusalem. There's nothing soon about 2,000 years for it to be there. It's talking about what's going to happen at the end or when Jerusalem has been destroyed. Okay, so then uh, the image of the beast comes directly from Daniel, the book of Daniel. And they want, John wants the reader, God wants the reader to go back and look at... <clears throat> Uh, what was predicted there in Daniel chapter 7. So Daniel chapter 7, 7, 3, it shows the four great beasts coming out of the sea, just like the beast in Revelations 13 comes out of the sea. <clears throat> the first three beasts in Daniel 7 are a lion, a bear, and a leopard. And the same three animals the, that make up the beast there in Revelation chapter 13. But it's the fourth beast in Daniel 7, 7, that's of interest in our chapter today, in chapter 13. The fourth beast is not like the other beast, and it has ten horns, just like the beast, in Reve you know, the, the beast over in Revelation 13. So Daniel sees this vision and wants to know the interpretation of the thing, of the, the beast in Daniel chapter 7, verse 16. And the answer <coughs> given is that the four beasts represent four kingdoms that arise on the earth. So now today, we're at a time that we can look back in history and we can know exactly who, what these kingdoms were that Daniel was seeing in his vision. So Daniel 2, 37, verse 30, uh, verses 37 and 38 in chapter 2 tell us that the first kingdom was the Babylonian Empire. So the Babylonian Empire is the first beast. The second beast is the Medo-Persian or the Persian Empire that defeated the Babylonian Empire. The third beast is <clears throat> that defeated the Persians or the Greeks, the Grecian, uh, na the Greek nation took over the Persians. And so that leaves us with the fourth beast. Who defeated the Greeks? The Romans. So the Roman Empire uh, began about 44 BC, went all the way to 476. Anybody know how the Roman Empire was destroyed? Yeah, they, they were destroyed from within. They were destroyed because 
they started trying to pay their enemies not to attack them. So just imagine you're a nation hanging out there. We're some little country and it's like, hey, we need some cash. Let's go hit this little place over here and we're going to give you some money. <clears throat> Spend that money, go back and attack them again. That's actually what happened. Uh, it was actually uh, what we call Germany now. Germany the, would come in and attack this one little place. Rome would pay them not to attack. They'd spend the money, attack again, go back and forth. Pretty soon you run out of money, right? So the, it just sort of implodes upon itself. <clears throat> you can't pay your enemies not to attack you. Uh, <clears throat> then, yes, sir. Yeah, and, and a lot of that, well, I go when I was talking about taxation, you're, you're taxing all these other people, and you're bringing that in to support, you know, that lifestyle. You, you pretty much didn't want to work. I just want my check coming. And it doesn't last long. It doesn't last. Every now, you know, these people out here are going to say, I'm tired of paying taxes for, to support that. And it just dissolves. So that uh, so someone asked me one time, what during the first century, what was the average Jewish person being taxed? If you add up all their taxes, they were being taxed ninety percent. What was the tithe? Can you see why they were a little upset? Yeah, between tithing and, I mean, they, they taxed, if you went to the restroom, they taxed how many wheels were on your cart, and they taxed the number of legs on your animals pulling the cart. They taxed what was in the cart. <clears throat> they taxed because you were using their road to pull the cart that had the four-legged animal that was pulling the two wheels. It was a tax, 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 tax. Then when they finally got to their destination to worship God, you have these Jewish leaders that are saying, hey, your, your offering's not good enough. Come in the back and I got a better sacrifice for you. That was the exchange. Or your money's not good enough for us. So it was a horrible time. They haven't got there yet in our country, but it feels like it sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> So we know which these nations are. We know that, um, that the fourth is the Roman Empire. But to show that Daniel and John are seeing the same beast, let's quickly look at the parallels uh, of their description. So I'm going to call out a verse. I need somebody to be in Revelation 13. Who wants to be my reader for Revelation 13? Okay, and then you're going to be Daniel. Okay, so I need you to go to Daniel chapter 7. So I'm going to read out a verse. Y'all speak loudly. <clears throat> so first, Richard, if you'll read Revelation 13, 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And then read Daniel 7, verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea one from another. So they both came up out of the sea first, and then Reve oh, you read Revelation 3, read verse 7. Daniel 7, 7. Both beasts have ten horns. And both, okay, then I need 13 verses 5 and 6. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. 
Daniel 7, 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And then also verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time, and times, and the dividing of times. So both speak against our God and his people. <clears throat> Richard read 42 months, that's three and a half years. You read three and a half years, times, times, time and a half, is three and a half years. So that chapter and chapter 13, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel 13, they're talking about the same, the same being the Roman Empire. They're talking about <clears throat> that the Roman Empire has no regard for the true God. The Roman Empire in its actions and how it goes against the saints and how it's going to to go after the church using the power of Satan himself and by the authority and the permission of going against the saints, <clears throat> they don't care about God. They don't care about God. In fact, they blame the Christians for everything. Christians were blamed. If, if you had a bad crop, it was the Christians' fault. If you got attacked by the Germans coming across, that was the Christians' fault. Everything was against the Christians. If there was a fire, you had a fire, your house burned. It was a Christian's fault. Nero used that, right? He wanted to get more land to build his, his palaces with, so he had some fires set there in Rome, cleaned out the area, just happened to be the area that he was wanting to extend his palaces to. But who did he blame? It was a Christian's fault. So <clears throat> that's when it's speaking against God or going against God's people, that was pretty common practice for what they were doing. So, um, <clears throat> so now that we know that chapter 7 of Daniel and chapter 13 of Revelation are the same, <clears throat> we can see that it's being prophesied about the Roman Empire. First one tells us that the Roman Empire is going to exercise great power and authority, and that power and authority is given to it by the dragon over in, in verse 2. That's Satan. The scriptures describe Satan as the ruler of this world. We can see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, and also John writes about it in 1 John chapter 5, 19, that Satan is the ruler of this world. Um, the combination of animals and the beast description reveals that the, the Roman Empire is more powerful, more dreadful than it's the ones that have been conquered before it. Daniel and John both make this, this point that the Roman Empire, uh, what the church is about to experience, the reason the churches are getting this warning, coming to it is it's going to be dreadful. It's not going to be now that the, the Jerusalem and this has been taken away that the, the church is going to be okay from here on. In fact, it's the very opposite. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, it says, And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these things. So Rome is going to, the Roman Empire is going to come against the Christians, but not just in a passing way. With the, they're coming with the intent of what they always do, what Rome always did to other nations, is to crush them. And then there's this unusual statement made about the beast. One of the heads of the beast takes a fatal wound to its head, um, which means certain death, but somehow the wound heals. But verse 14 says that the wound, it was wounded by the sword and yet lived. 
for one of the heads to receive a fatal wound suggests the beast is about to die somehow, but it survives. And again, that's where when Vespasian comes in 69 AD, he stabilizes the Roman Empire and it grows and it becomes stronger than ever. And that causes the world to start worshiping the beast. So a nation has now come up, it's gone through this civil war, and now the other nations say they're invincible, and it just causes the beast to grow. Okay, verse, um, Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. There we go. Sure. Uh, five through eight. Um, uh, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written and what Richard just read is a direct correlation to Daniel chapter 11 verses 36 verses chapter 11 verses 36 and 37 where it says the same thing it says that he's allowed to go and speak these blasphemous names against our God against the church also, if you look over at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Let no one deceive you in this way, for that day will come, that day will not come, unless the rebellion comes first. That man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he makes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming, him, proclaiming himself to be God. So now the Roman Empire, the Caesars, <clears throat> that are the emperors that are there, not only want you to worship the Roman Empire, they want you to worship them. That's called Caesar worship. You might have read that through history. It's just Caesar worship. They had temples built to themselves. They had statutes and idols built to themselves. And you were to go and pay homage to Caesar by worshiping him, bringing him tribute, that's money, bringing him a tithe to worship him. If you're a Christian, do you have a problem? So they even kept ledgers, they kept ledgers of did you pay your temple tax your worship to Caesar, did you pay that or not? <clears throat> Can you show proof? Can you show your receipt that you paid your tribute to Caesar? <clears throat> and Christians could not show that proof. They could not. So what happens? Well, you, you get someone who shows up at your house, so you need to go up there and pay your tax, or your tithe. Your tribute. You need to go pay homage to Caesar. Can't do that. I'm a Christian. Well, how come he doesn't have to pay and I had to pay? So there starts to be this animosity between everybody else while they're having to go do this and why Christians are refusing to go do this. So they thought of Christians as being obstinate, just hard to get along with. When all they were saying is, there's one God, I only worship one God. Reminds you of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego, right? I'm not worshiping that thing. You can throw me, in a, a, throw me in there, throw me in the furnace. Don't care. Without any knowledge, without any knowledge that they were going to be saved. These Christians were having to go through the same thing. You want to take me to prison? Take me to prison. You want to kill me with a sword? Kill me with a sword. But I ain't worshiping Caesar. I'm not doing that. I'm not going against my God. I'm not going to blaspheme against his name. I'm not going to do it. See the problem? 
Rome has with Christians? See the problem Christians have with Rome? So this conflict is coming. <clears throat> Daniel said, just messing with you, Robin, just messing with you. It wasn't Robin's phone that went off. <laughs> Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times of the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and time and a half. So that length of time, this is not a long period of time this is going to happen. This, but the Christians had to be aware that heavy persecutions were coming. There's a prophetic warning in verses 9 and 10. It says the paragraph, about the, uh, the paragraph about the beast concludes with a prophetic warning. But notice the force of the command to listen to this warning. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Who used to say that, or who does say that all the time in the scriptures? <clears throat> so this is that wake up. If you've got an ear, listen. Or it's listen up is what we would say. Listen up. <clears throat> if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword he must be slain. So in summary, what it's saying is this, war, this beast is going to war against you. Don't give up your faith. Don't leave God for this. If they're going to take you to prison, go to prison. If you're going to die, die. But don't give up your faith. So many, even Paul, when Paul's on trial before Nero, is there and he says, Everybody's left me except Jesus. The Lord is with me, but everybody else has left me. When pressure comes against us, we've got to hold fast. When someone says, hey, you're a Christian, I'm going to put you in prison for that. Go to prison. If somebody says, I'm going to take your life, Paul, because... You profess to be a Christian. Oh, I don't profess to be a Christian. I am a Christian. If that means losing this earthly life, lose it. But don't give up your faith. Don't give up. And that's what they're being told. These are going to be such hard times, you're going to be tempted to say it's not worth it. The example that we have from the Apostle Paul says that people did. People said, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm going to go back to my other life before I had to put up with all this. Can you imagine going home today? You're eating supper and that knock on the door comes and they're saying, we heard you're Christians. Come with us. And they, they put a gun out and take you away. Are you going to say, let's go? Or are you going to say, wait a minute, let's talk about this? Where's your faith? And what they're, they're being told is, don't give up. This life is not our home. We are just passing through. There's nothing in this life worth, worth it. Nothing. It's beautiful. There are some pretty places. These leaves are turning colors. They're pretty and they're beautiful. Not worth it. Not worth your eternity. I love you all. Have a good week. Teach someone about Jesus. We'll pick up there next week.